Hi, my name is Stacy Sailors. I'm a board certified behavior analyst with Stockton Unified's Mental Health and Behavior Support Services Department. The following presentation is a four week series titled BCBA Coffee Talk. These coffee talks were virtual meetings with parents hosted by a board certified behavior analyst. All presentations were developed by myself, Edgar Cardoza, and Alejandra Urbina who are also board certified behavior analysts in our department. The topics covered during this four weeks included reasonable expectations, setting schedules, setting limits, motivating your child, and managing challenging behaviors. If you're interested in additional resources, I encourage you to go to our website, which you can find off the Stockton Unified School District's main webpage. There, you will go to departments click on mental health and behavior support services, and then go to where it says parent and caregiver resources. There you can find links for our student and family resources, our helpline, and even our YouTube channel. All right, how to motivate learning. So this is probably really, really, this is the number one question, right? Like, I have tips and, and tricks that I can get them to work, but what I really need is for them to do work on their own and for them to want to do work. Um, a lot of parents ask, how do I get my kids to actually do the work when I'm not there? Well, the answer is motivation. And we can get it if, if, if we can get our students excited about learning to log on and learn each day, productivity and progress is what's gonna follow. Um, so here are some ways that we can uh, go about learning. Oops, I went to the wrong one. So the first steps are going to be to just uh, understand your expectations and determine what's going to work for your kid. Um, understand those expectations for distance learning. You want to communicate with your child's teacher and you want to figure out what is going to be uh, important for your child to work. How much time should your child be spending online doing work? So it's unreasonable during these times that we're gonna expect our kids to be spending six and a half hours a day online doing work. More realistically, uh, a couple hours a day doing really good work uh, for a middle schooler is an average expectation. You can increase that a little bit for a high schooler and decrease it for an elementary school child. And when I say middle school, I'm talking about those six, seven, eighth grade years. Also, it depends on your kid um, and what your child is going to be able to do. So we really want to make sure that you're communicating with your, with your teacher to see what are the expectations for my student based off of what are the expectations through the class. Um, and you want to familiarize yourself with that online learning platform, if it's Google Classroom, if it's um, dojo class dojo any of those the more that you can familiarize the more that you're going to help set them up and the reason why this is important is we want to make sure that when we're motivating our kids we're setting them up for for success we're not setting them up for failure so once we've determined how they work and or once we determine what the expectations are then we want to determine how they're going to work what are the types of distant activities that your kid prefers so um, if they like more of the interaction, um, if they like to do more projects, then again, communicate with your teacher and to see what can be done with that. If they like to do things more with you than, than doing it independently, let's use that to our advantage so that they, way we can say, hey, first you need to work a little bit on your own and then I can come and help you. Um, also, if they prefer to do watch videos and that's acceptable because a lot of now that we're on online a lot of things are moving towards videos watching videos and making some comments on that so again figuring out what they prefer and working with that um, and if they do need some of those um, more of the one-to-one -one check ins maybe again follow up with your teacher and see if you can even set up some additional check ins for your child if what they've set up isn't enough So once you've identified what uh, the expectations are and how you're going to have your child work on those things, then again, like I said, we need to make sure that we're setting your child up for success. Um, 
you, you're going to need to make sure motivation helps get your child to work independently and it comes from seeking out a reward. So we're going to make sure that what, so if we've come up with some reasonable expectations, we know how much they need to work on, what's mandatory versus what's not mandatory. Um, and we figured out how they're gonna do that, how we're going to, to, to set it up um, and what their preferences are, then we're gonna figure out what specifically we're going to have them do, meaning like what can be done versus what can't be done. Certain things, for example, I, I'll, I'll share my daughter. My daughter is 13 years old and she is distance learning right now. And her teacher um, set up an, a non-mandatory activity for her to read two Greek uh, uh, big mythology books, the Iliad and the Odyssey, over a two week period. Um, these are huge, really difficult books to read and there's no way that my child would be able to do that, just not. So I communicated with my teacher and I was like, is this really mandatory? And she said, no, 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 it's just an extra credit, something for them to do. So again, it's what can be done versus what can be done. If I set my child up for that, then she's gonna fail and that's gonna reduce her motivation. And it's not gonna keep her going for the next thing. So I wanna make sure, oh, that, that project, that's, that's not mandatory. I don't think my daughter's gonna be successful at that. I'm just gonna let it go. And then I'm gonna ask my, my daughter, what's her goals? What does she want to do? Is, what does she like out of getting from this distance learning? Does she like having some of that one-to-one -one time? Um, is she hoping to, you know, does she like science? Does she want to work on some more projects? So all of those things you can kind of figure out and, and, and piece together with your teacher to help keep her motivated or keep your child motivated. I, I keep saying her because of my daughter. But again, keep your child being motivated for that. And, and then make sure that the goals that you're setting are small and achievable. Um, if we are going, if, even if my daughter loves science projects, and, but I'm setting up something for her that's going to take a lot of equipment, it's going to take a lot of writing, a lot of research, and it's going to last over several days, that's probably not the best thing to set her up for. So again, looking for things that, well, maybe this is the big project that we need to get done, but we're going to start with step one, step two, step three, and we're going to break that up into smaller chunks. And then it was like, oh, your first goal is to get to this. And then your next goal is to get to this. Um, so again, the more that we can break things up and, and make those goals achievable and make sure that we're working with a teacher, the more that our children are gonna be set up for success. So we also wanna make sure that we are setting up some times to take breaks and encourage movement. And remember when we were talking about goals, we said we want to make sure that those goals are small, right? Um, and depending on your child, you may need to break up what they're doing throughout the day. Um, you, the work that they're doing, it, you may need to increase uh, how often they're taking breaks or even getting out of their chair. Um, especially if your child is younger, they may need to move more frequently throughout the day um, and get some, some of that exercise out. Get those wiggles out. Um, I know for a lot of kids, even if they're older, just sitting, the longer that they sit there, the lower their motivation gets. So getting them up, getting them moving, breaking up their day can really, really be helpful. You also wanna be flexible. It's really important to be flexible with your expectations. While we may have thought initially our goals were really small and achievable, once we start on the path to achieve them, we may find that we still need to scale back a bit. And it's okay to adjust midway. Um, so make sure that, that you're okay with that. All right, I'm going to take a pause here so that if you have any questions, we can touch base. I'm going to pause our recording. Okay. So as we talked about taking those breaks and encouraging movement, um, again, just to, to follow up on that, it is important to make sure that our kids are getting those breaks and getting the, their wiggles out as much as possible. And on top of that, we're being flexible with our expectations. And being flexible with our expectations also means adjusting our schedule as needed. Um, frustration is going to happen. It's going to happen with you. It's going to happen with your kids. So you need to make sure that you're 
allowing for that to happen and not getting overwhelmed and allowing for changes to happen um, that allow for some breaks. Maybe that task needs to just sit for a little bit. We're going to put a pin in it. We're going to put it in a parking lot and we're going to come back to it later that day or maybe later a different day. And if your child is starting to come up against things where they're either really avoiding it or they're not motivated to do it or they get started on it, but they're not being productive, that may be because that task is just too tough for them. And those are the things that would then, again, maybe we thought that this is something that they could be more independent with, but we actually see that they need more help and more support during that time. So being flexible is key and that will help set your child up for success to keep them motivated to keep going. And also communicate with your child's teacher on how to help them navigate those challenging tasks. The last point that I wanna make about this is that setting goals is important and can help with motivation. It can help keep people on task, it can help with productivity, help with focus, but it can also be a crutch. And we may get really caught up in once we set a goal that we need to follow through. And that's it, that's where that goal is. However, Again, if you're seeing that the child that your child is really having a hard time meeting that goal, then that is saying that the child isn't ready for that goal yet. And it would be better to adjust it and lower our expectations so that the child can be successful and experience failure and not re uh, and, and experience success. Having them experience success rather than experiencing failure is really, really important because the more that they can do that, then that's starting to build some momentum that, oh, I, I set a goal, I did what I needed to do, and I got, I achieved that goal, I got that reward. And the more that they do that, the easier it is for them to be able to go on to the next goal. If they, especially early on, if you're setting up goals that they're just not gonna reach and we start to fail, then that, the motivation is really going to start to plummet and it's gonna be hard to get that back. To make sure that if things aren't going well, that's okay. Be flexible, take stock, readjust, and help set your kids up for success. If your kids are older, like middle school age, um, it also can be important to help encourage them part, uh, to communicate with you and be a part of that adjustment process. Because as they're getting older and older and more independent, they're gonna come up against these roadblocks on their own, especially as they leave, leave school and go on in their life after school. Um, they're going to come up with setting goals and not meeting them. That's a part of life. But the difference between somebody who can be successful and, and maintain motivation, even in the face of failure, is someone who knows, oh, I didn't meet the goal, but I'm going to take stock. I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to try again in a different way. And I'm going to learn from that. The more that you can make them part of that process, the more that they start to learn that now and become comfortable with that, with making those adjustments as needed, and they become more resilient. So all of that is really important. In addition to setting some goals, we can also use some visuals to help focus. These can be visual checklists. Um, it can help, it can be helpful to help them stay focused on what needs to happen, on what's coming up, but also as a useful uh, tool to prompt and redirect. That way, if you have it written down, if you have it in a visual, it helps to take out the negotiation. Um, make sure it's almost like an agreement, right? So if we have it set out, like first you're gonna do this and then you're gonna do this, they've agreed upon it. It's a mini contract. And once you're going into, well, once we need to finish this, we're going to get this. Um, that helps to minimize some of that negotiation throughout the process because you get that done ahead of time and then it's there and you can redirect them to what needs to happen. As well as a, as a to-do list, if you have things that need to get done, you can help them. Oh, what, what do you need to have done? I see that you're, you're getting off task. Remember, if we get all of this done and you, then you get more free time, you get more time to do this. Um, or you, we, you know, we only have a couple more hours left. We need to make sure how we can get this done in the next couple hours. Um, you can also incorporate it into a reward system. So again, 
having them be able to set up some small goals once they reach those goals, then they can get some preferred activities or some sort of rewards. And we'll talk about that more later. Some examples of visuals, um, it can be anywhere from a first then board, um, that is this one over here. Um, that's great for our younger kids or our kids who really just need super small goals. Like first we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do this. Um, and you can make it, you can print something like this out. Um, those resources are, are linked to our website um, where you can find these types of, of uh, visuals and print them out. Or you can even just write it down, like just literally first you're going to do this or then you're going to do this. Or you could even just hold up something, if it, especially if it's a toy or it's a preferred activity. If it's like, hey, first you need to do your work, then you can play on your play your games and then you can play on my phone or, or you can watch TV. You can have some sort of token of that being held out or like up, it's, it's up out of their reach, but visible so that they know once I complete this, then I get access to the other thing. Um, you can look at over here, we have uh, charts and graphs. So where they're completing things out and then you're setting up certain rewards for them to get after they fill out so many points. Um, and again, this would probably be better for our older elementary kids, our uh, middle school kids, kids that can have more delayed reinforcement and can last a little longer. Another way of doing it, which is um, something that is a bit more natural, meaning that um, it's easy to do, and for older kids who can write, they could also start to do this independently on their own, is creating checkoff lists. I love checkoff lists. I'm a checkoff list type of person. I'm always kind of going through and, and checking off my list. And now that my, I've done that with my daughter, uh, when we first started with COVID, um, you know, it was a lot of helping her along with that, but now she's creating her own checkoff list throughout the day. And again, that didn't come magically. That came because we set up small things for her to do and allowed for her to get some reward for once she started completing those, those things, as well as taking some breaks in between. So that leads us to our very next topic, which is providing breaks. It's, it is really important to take breaks. No one, it's very rare for anyone to be able to maintain focus on an activity for an extended period of time. Anything past 30 minutes is a long time for our kids, even our high schoolers. So it's definitely okay to stop and provide some breaks and to slow down and give them time to process an activity. Um, Maybe even once, you know, once they've figured out what they're going to do or we know what the activity is, they may need some additional think time or some process time to figure out how they're going to get started and what that's gonna look like. Um, it's also okay not to complete things in an entire sitting. Again, that's why it's important to make sure that we're breaking things down into small chunks. Um, and, and even looking at completing projects across days rather than across hours. Um, if I really like the Pomodoro method, this is a way of trying to break things up and really kind of help with focus and, and productivity. Um, Pomodoro means for apple in French. Um, and it's called Pomodoro after the apple timer. And the method is that we're breaking up learning or working into small chunks. So you'll work or focus for 25 minutes and then you take a five minute brain break after four Pomodoro cycles. So that's a long time, right? So that's 30 minutes a cycle, um, so four is two hours of work. That's a long time. Um, then they would take a 15 to 30 minute break. So take a much longer break to kind of get away and, and, and really kind of uh, decompress. This is a, a, a proven method. It's, it, it's been shown to really help increase productivity. You don't need an Apple timer to do the Pomodoro method. Any timer that you, that you have could work. It could be your kitchen timer that's on your microwave. Um, or in your kitchen. Uh, it could be a timer that's on your phone. You can also try and get some free apps um, and put them on your children's device as well that kind of automatically prompts them or even put it on your device. Um, uh, one that I like is called Be Focused. There's two versions, Be Focused and Be Focused Pro. Be Focused is the free version. It works just as well as the pro version. The only difference is with pro version, you pay for that, but then you don't have ads. But again, the ads are very minimal um, and it works really well. It automatically sets the timers for you. 
Um, and you can even add tasks to it. You can edit it and say, you know, like we're going to work on language arts for this time and you can have a, a check off embedded in it. So I really like this method. Um, it helps. It's, it's a, a nice strategy to help break up the day. And again, to set up some realistic expectations, work 25 minutes and then get a, a five minute break. Because sometimes if we take it up into tasks, well, some tasks are gonna take longer than others, or if the child knows, oh, if I have to finish this first, um, and then I get you know, time on my, my tablet, then what they might be producing is really sloppy, messy, minimal work. Um, and if we really want them, I mean, to, to try their best and to keep working and, and to be motivated to work, then it's sometimes better to take it off from finishing tasks to more of just looking at reinforcing time periods of hard work. Okay, I think that this is a good time to take a quick break and for us to touch base really quick and see if there's any questions. So I am going to... Another way to motivate learning is to help, um, again, put your child in that driver's seat and um, provide some choices. So allowing your child to have some control on their learning choices can be really, really helpful. Even if they're things that they don't necessarily want to do, but the fact that they could choose which one, the lesser of the, the two, uh, is, is good, right? So we wanna make sure that we offer those choices. Um, you can do science or you can do reading, you pick. You could also provide choices in which ones do you do first? Like you have to do science and you have to do reading, so which one are you going to do first? Um, extracurricular activities. So if your child is doing art or doing uh, music, again, having those kind of be embedded onto, um, into their schedule and even having choices. So, hey, we need to, to put in some fun time for you or some art time for you. So when do you want that to happen? And, and what do you want to have happen? Um, making sure that they can, uh, have that freedom to make those choices helps to, again, take away that power struggle and helps with providing that motivation because it's something that they've chosen. The other thing that you can provide choices with are things of, uh, of your time, right? Of, of things that they can do independently versus things that they can get help with, especially if your child is someone who's, who needs more support and really likes it when you're working with him or her. It's re this can be a good way of helping them get motivated, setting up your attention as reinforcement, but again, kind of putting it in the driver's seat. Like, all right, let's look through your day. What are the things that you're gonna need help with? Which one do you want me to help you with? You can pick three things um, versus you know these subjects. Which one do you want me to help you with? All right, so which ones are you gonna do on your own? Okay, great. You've had that agreement and then you can write it down so that that way it's a prompt for them and it helps them to get motivated. And what I would do again is break it up, break it up. So have them work independently, then get a little bit of your time, have them work independently, and then get a little bit of your time. They picked which ones they wanted your help on. Now we're going to have them work for those things. Um, and then lastly, what's really important as we're setting up these goals and we're trying to continue this motivation, I hate to say it, but motivation isn't just natural, right? It's not something that a lot of our kids are just born with. They're not naturally motivated to do well. Some are, but a lot of them aren't, especially as they're getting more and more time away from the actual school and contact with their peers, their motivation may go down. So we need to start looking at providing some things to them that help keep them motivated. A really easy way of doing that is positive feedback you know, make sure we're praising them, providing that immediate positive feedback as soon as they're completing the activity or meeting those little goals. It could be as simple as just putting a check mark and praising them to um, having, you know, giving some high fives to really kind of giving them a lot of uh, praise and attention. Um, it's gonna be dependent on your child. I will say that I think it's important to make sure that whatever your positive attention is and the feedback that you're giving them, um, it's tailored to your child. Some kids love for you to make a big deal out of them and some really don't. And what I always say about this is 
the proof the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. If you see that your kids are working harder with that positive attention, then it's working. If you see that they're starting to avoid things, well, then it's not working. So you may want to look at how you're interacting with them and how you're praising them. Age is also important. You know, for little ones, it may be more of exaggerated gestures, that kind of sticky, sweet uh, feedback. For older kids, that might be really punishing for them and they don't like it. So then you may be looking at more of just talking to them, saying things about how you're proud of them. Be specific with your feedback. Also, the other thing, if you have siblings or if they have siblings or there's other people around, or even if you have a support network, um, praising to others can be really effective. That could be like talking to the other kids that are in there like, oh my gosh, look at uh, Josie. She's doing an amazing job with getting her, you know, the, the reading has been really tough, but she's been working hard at getting things done. Um, making a phone call to a family member to share that news. However, if your kid is not as shy and does not like that type of attention and doesn't like to be in the spotlight, don't do that. Um, again, it could make them be less uh, motivated because if they work hard, mom's going to give me all that attention or dad's going to give me all that attention. It makes me feel uncomfortable. So the proof is in the pudding. If what you're, what you're doing with your attention is working, then it's working. Keep doing it. If it's not working and you're seeing that they're more and more avoiding, avoiding those tasks, then we need to look at changing things up. And that also may be that we need to look at adding in some additional rewards. So these things could include stickers, choosing a movie or a show to stream, games, ice cream, candy, some special treats, um, having additional time on tablets or phones, um, or choosing a fun family activity. Depending on your child, these may not all be necessary, or none of them may be necessary. Maybe just praise is enough. But your child, like we said, your child's motivation grow. Um, your child's motivation doesn't always come naturally, and we often need to give our kids a bit of a boost. And if it was working before, but we're seeing it's kind of fading off, then that's when we see that we need to give them a bit of a boost. These special treats and rewards, that's going to help provide them with some extra re reinforcement that comes from setting small goals, achieving those goals, and then getting that reward. And more, the more and more that that's paired together, I finish a goal, I get something I like, then just completing the goal becomes in and of itself rewarding. And then we can start having it be where you're working longer and longer periods of time, or maybe you don't even need those extra rewards anymore because now you, that extrinsic motivation is turned into more of an intrinsic motivation. And sometimes our kids, they, they never have intrinsic motivation. They work really hard for reward. And you know what? That's okay. We work because we get a paycheck. I don't know very many people who work for free. So it depends on your learner. It depends on your, your, your family situation. It depends on what's going to work for you and your family and your kids. So, and again, the proof is in the pudding. If it's not working, then go ahead and take stock. Look at making some adjustments. Be flexible. Maybe add in some additional rewards and then start to look at potentially fading those out as they get more and more successful. All right, that's it.